some of you would be with me. <laughs> but um, I know that this will be a, a blessed time for you all, and I just speak blessings over your families and everything that God will do in this season. And I pray peace. <laughs> I remember Thanksgiving was the, not peace at my house. <laughs> But, you know, I believe that we can have that. Um, hmm. I want us to do something, and I'm just going to ask you to stand with me real quick. I think it's important that we begin to declare um, or just speak out what God has given us. It's like our statement for the Scribal Conservatory. And it is, I'm going to read it, and you can just repeat after me. I'm going to pause. And it says, we are committed to restoring, affirming, equipping, strengthening, and building Christ's creative remnant. The other thing that I want us to highlight is that we're here to transform nations. We're here to transform nations. Reinforce covenant. Reinforce covenant. Elevate Christ above men. 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 And increase understanding. And increase understanding. That is the heart of, of what the Scribal Conservatory is about. And I think every single time we meet, we need to... Um, declare those things, and um, even if you're not a, a core part, declare it for us and over us. And I think it's important that um, over the next next year, because I don't know if you realize it, but we'll, it'll be a year coming up in January, and so that we've been doing this and faithful to it. It's been um, a huge learning curve for me being stationary. And so we're looking at, but I'm empowered to do this, and I can see it now. So in January, we're running, we're running, we're going to increase, we're going to have every seat here filled the first Sunday in January. Amen. And we're all going to take part in doing that. And so we will have some strategy and some insight. But the other thing that I want to um, say that I believe that over the next year, what these things mean will be made clear to us. So we're going to begin to teach into um, what this means. I've been writing some things out and clarifying some things. So I believe that as we go forward, especially with the school, because that's what the conservatory is. And the word conservatory or conservator, it means to protect, to preserve. So that's what we're here to do. We're going to protect and preserve the presence of the Lord in, in, in our lives in our communities and in what he's building in the midst of us. So, amen. amen. So you can be seated. You can be seated. Listen, I'm, I'm really excited about what God is doing, and I want to just thank my husband, Leonard. He is in the back. You all know him. <laughs> and so he's been, um, he works all the time. But I just have to say that, you know, this. <laughs> I could not do this without his help. And he's always been a supporter of everything that God has given me ministry-wise. And so I really appreciate that. And we working, and we feeling it now that we're getting ready to hit that big number. <laughs> but um, I thank God for, you know, that, well, I won't even say it because we're on live. <laughs> so, yeah, we can laugh, y'all. We can laugh. <laughs> so, um this is, you know, I, I asked L.A. to release a spoken word piece, and so we're going to switch spots with her real quick. I want her to share this piece, you know, with, with us before we go into the teaching today. I think it is powerful. Afterwards, if the Lord inspires or empowers you, we're going to have an opportunity for you to share as well. But I think that I haven't heard it, so I don't know what's coming. <laughs> But um, I believe it's going to fit perfectly with the message the Lord has given me. And I'm not one to linger, so we're going to do this. I'm going to go directly into the teaching. Is there anything, Dr. King? Okay, and then we're going we're gonna to move forward. I'm going to stand. Okay. The title of this poem is I Have Everything. What I have, I cannot see. 
with eyes wide as the horizon. My hands at time reach out in deceit, filled with imagined bounties of stored up treasures from above, like being full when my stomach is empty, or sipping the living waters daily as my body grows more and more dehydrated, yet my thirst stops. I must endure and faint not. In troubles, hard times, and distresses, I lean on the one and only God, for he alone delivers me out of these messes. I've been beat, but not broken. Imprisoned, and yet I hear his voice there. All I have has been stolen, yet I muster up enough to still share because I still care. No matter how unfair, I've been there on the brink of death's door. At times I can hear it knocking, but I can't, I won't, I will not answer. Been drugged through the lies of yet. I've climbed towards truth. I've been filled with this love, but still called an imposter. Been ignored, yet my name was right there at the top of the roster. Through every sad time I've smiled on. Every weak thought I've walked strong. Every moment I'm here is a moment that's gone. And when I need to be encouraged, it's when I find myself alone. Yet, and still I have everything. Because the creator of the universe is within me. And as long as he grants me breath, I still breathe. You'll never take away what you can't give. Look again, I have everything. Amen. 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 Thank you. All right. Bless you. Um, thinking of how to start, I want to thank you. I'm going to be talking about the prophetic life. The prophetic life. And if you have your Bibles, I'm going to encourage you to turn with me to 2 Corinthians 6. Now, in the scribe school, and I know this is the scribal conservatory, so I'm going to speak to you as a scribe. When I study the Bible, I want to always encourage you to study with a formal translation. And what that means is that it's a, it's a translation that's as closely to word for word that you can get within the English language. So I'm encouraging you to do that. And then you can use your favorite Bibles in, in consideration of that. Because I use that, but I also use, especially if you don't know Greek, <laughs> you know, you don't know um, Hebrew. And then you can go get your favorite Bible, like the complete Jewish Bible or, the, you know, or um, any paraphrase. I'll just say it that way. And build upon that because I really believe that we have to have an understanding of the word before we read other people's ideas. Mm -hmm. We need a foundation that's as clear as it can be, not just conceptual. And I like to dig out the word to find truth. And so I always encourage that, but I also then say after you do that, then you can go read the next 15 best Bibles. And you can discern or determine what makes most sense to you. Does that make sense? So with that said, I'm going to be teaching um, between the NIV and the um, complete Jewish Bible. And if there's a better way to say it, we'll find that in between also. But for study purposes, I think it's very important that we develop the habit of digging out the word or, or excavating the word of God. Trying to find every treasure we possibly can, not just by revelation, but by what is written. <laughs> So we're going to talk about the prophetic life. Um, the poem that was just shared was called I Have Everything. But I want you to listen to this from, from Paul. I want you to listen to what he said. If you, were, if you attended the Scribal Advance this year, I talked about um, the, su the, the supernatural. The Lord gave me that about a year and a half ago, and I've kind of been meditating on it. I like to internalize the word, make it real to me. So... I want you to think about the word internalizing because we read things and we get it in our head, but when it's internalized, it becomes a part of you. Amen. It becomes um, part of your DNA. It becomes a part of um, your thought processes. It becomes a part of your belief system. So I think it's important that we internalize the word. So I've not always studied the supernatural. 
Now, I'm one of those people that, you know, we hear about the supernatural and we think magic. We think the spirit realm. We think um, a moment in time when something spectacular happens. So we, we kind of crossed into that when we talked about the supernatural at the Scrabble Advance. But I am of the belief that we're supernatural all the time. I really believe that. I really believe that. And I'm going to share that with you a little bit, just a little bit, you know, when we talk about the prophetic life. I want to read this to you. 2 Corinthians 6, 1 through 10. This is where we're going. This is um, the Apostle Paul speaking, and this is what he says. As God's fellow co-workers, we also urge you not to receive his grace and then go and do nothing with it. For he says, at the acceptable time, I heard you, and the day of salvation, I helped you. We understand that Christ demands nothing from us. This is not a demand that, that, that the Apostle Paul is sharing. He's not demanding that we do nothing with it. He's advising us, don't take the grace you have been given and then do absolutely nothing with it. Amen. In other words, don't take this and not internalize it and make it real to your life. That's what he's saying here. But there is an expectation and there is an, a desire that, that once we get this gift from God, that we love him enough that we will want to do it. Amen. See, the hope of Christ is that I love him enough to want to live the life that is destined for me. It's not just that I'm saved, but that I want to fulfill every single thing. Amen. I've been through too much and too far not to see what God has given me fulfilled or internalized mm -hmm. in my life, that transformation can come. So this is my interpretation of, of what is being presented here. The next passage, he says this, we try not to put obstacles in anyone's path. I love that. So that no one can find fault with the work that we do. He's saying that we're out here, we're ministering the gospel, but we're doing it not to put obstacles in people's paths, but to position them to inherit the grace that we have. Amen. We want to show them that they have an inheritance. So that no one can find fault with the work that we do. On the contrary, we try to commend ourselves in every way as workers for God, continually enduring troubles, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, overwork, lack of sleep and food. <laughs> oh, did you hear this? Now, we know that in the time that Paul wrote this, history-wise, they're enduring death. They're being beaten to death. They're being spit on. They're being chased down the street. They're being impaled with, with, with these um, spears. I mean, they are suffering. They are suffering. So he's saying this out of his suffering place. And we need to consider how we are suffering or, or the things that we consider challenges in our own lives and listen to what he's saying. We try to commend ourselves in every way as workers for God continually enduring our hardships. He never said, let's get together and pray this away. Not once. Not once. I was sharing with um, one of the young ladies that, that I mentor, and, and I told her, I said, that what I'm learning right now is that you keep going, and you keep doing, and you keep going, and you keep doing till you don't have to do that anymore. But you still got to do what you have to do. It's amazing. He said, and I love the word commend because what the commend means is to prove ourselves, not like proving ourselves to people, but to show ourselves worthy of pushing forward, that we're not stopping, that we're not stopping. He said, we prove ourselves in every way as workers for God. By what? By enduring our trials. 
I think it's important that we talk about this because not that everybody here is going through something horrible because there's one thing I know, the older you get, the more intense the struggle and the trouble. It really is. There is a real death that we'll have to face in the physical realm. It's just there are people we love that will pass away. There are tragedies that you're going to face. There's job loss. There's all kinds of things. There's sickness. There will be trouble. That is not a word curse. That's truth. We live in a fallen world, and every day these bodies age. I can do nothing to stop my hair from graying. I can color it, press it, curl it, but I am still aging. Pray that out. <laughs> so, so you kind of get what I'm saying in that. But listen, listen to what he says here. He says, we commend ourselves. I love building foundations, so consider this a foundation. We commend ourselves by our purity, knowledge, patience, and kindness, by which the Ruach HaKadosh, I've switched over to the Jewish Bible, sorry about that, by the Ruach HaKadosh, by genuineness of love and truthfulness of speech. Oh my goodness, listen to this. In your trouble, you prove yourself by being pure. Pure of thoughts, pure of your actions, pure of heart. By will, because you desire to please God. Amen. Yes. So I don't care how miserable you are, there is an expectation of loving God to the point that you want to stay and honor him in the midst of that. Amen. See, God's love wants us, causes us to want to do what? Please him. Amen. We have to love him enough to want to be like him. Because the race is for his likeness. Not just for the reward. It's for his likeness to be transformed into his image. So we commend ourselves by our purity, by our knowledge. And this is not a knowledge of, not, it's a knowledge of Christ, a knowledge of God. By patience and kindness, by the Ruach HaKadosh, by genuineness of Ahava, covenant love, and fruitful and truthfulness of speech. In other words, let's just be honest. How you doing today? It's a bad day. Oh, I'm blessed. It's a bad day. <laughs> You're blessed, but it's still a bad day. But guess what? You determine how you respond to that day. Yes. Teresa determines how she would respond to that day. <laughs> Listen to this. We do it by genuineness of love and truthfulness of speech. And get this, the next session, section, and by God's power. That was powerful to me because it indicates that everything else you need to do. Mm -hmm. And... God's power. So you do it. And you also trust in God's power. We commend ourselves through our use of righteous weapons. Wow. Righteous weapons. Purity. Knowledge. Patience. Kindness. In other words, responding in the right way to trouble. Not just putting on the armor of God. Because people do that all day and still don't respond right to the trouble in their lives. You can declare a thing and on the flip side of that, act the complete opposition to that thing you declare. So our righteous weapons include the right mindset, the right type of thinking. Whether for pressing our cause or defending it. Through being honored and dishonored, praised and blamed, considered deceptive and sincere, unknown and famous. So whether anybody knows you or not, whether they think you're a, a witch or not, whether they think you no matter what they think, he's saying we have to continue to endure trouble. It's, I'm going somewhere. It might be a little boring right now, but just bear with me. And we commend ourselves as God's workers headed for death. Now, in this sentence, when he's talking about headed for death, he literally means they're trying to kill me. 
He literally means they're trying to crucify me. So he's not talking about a spiritual death. He's talking about a physical threat on his life and on the lives of the other Christians. So we have to keep this in context because that sentence right there is imperative that he know that we know he's talking about their specific situation. This, this is not our situation because none of us are at threat of death, I don't think. No assassins are after anybody in this room. <laughs> but he said, look at, look at this. He said, yet yeah, look. People are trying to kill him. And he said, yet yeah, look, we are alive. Amen. All this trouble. I mean, people are trying to kill him. He's being accused left and right. He's being blamed for all these things. Frustration all around. But he's saying in all of this, look, because we are alive. Some people are what? Dead. As punished, yet not killed. He said, we've even been beat down to the ground, but we have not been killed. What is Paul doing? He's looking to the God side. Not the bright side, but the God side. As having reason to be sad. He said, I have every reason in the world to be sad. Every reason in the world to be sad. But he is choosing not to be. He said, yet I'm always filled with joy. Even though I'm poor, I'm here making people rich. As having nothing, yet having everything. What is this everything? How can I attain that everything? Ever since I began this, this journey of understanding the supernatural and, and not following the status quo of the supernatural because I realized I spent too much of my life trying to operate in a prophetic gift. I spent too much of my life trying to prophesy well. I spent too much of my life trying to be a great orator, a speaker, the one who lays hands and the person falls out. Come on, it's not just me. At some point, we have to graduate from that because something is wrong with that type of thinking. It's not supernatural thinking. Listen, how do we prove ourselves? We prove ourselves by embracing a prophetic lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Not just prophetic moves. Mm -hmm. Because see, a person that doesn't know they're prophetic are looking for a move. Mm -hmm. A person who doesn't understand that they are intrinsically prophetic will seek to find a way to exercise a prophetic gift instead of realize that they themselves are the prophetic word spoken and the prophetic gift. Come on, Jesus. Yes. Wow. A person who doesn't understand the prophetic will look for an encounter. Right. Not realizing that they are the encounter. Wow. Wow. Every time you sleep, Every time you perceive, every time you discern, every time you hear the voice of God, every time you, oh, I feel this, you're operating in your nature. Come on, Jesus. Oh. Something that has been internalized in who you are. But when we nurture the man and not the identity, yes. we separate the two. I'm just Teresa today. I do it all the time. Why can't I be Teresa all the time? There's not a spiritual me and a natural me. That's, that defeats the 
explains the whole purpose of the gospel. Okay. The prophetic is not hearing the voice of God. The prophetic is not operating in miracle signs and wonders. The prophetic is the presence of God. I was wondering how in the world can I be drawing so much from one person? Because God said you're drawing from my presence. The prophetic is our habitation. Amen. In my father's house, there are many mansions. And I go to prepare a place for you. We've interpreted it as meaning I got this big mansion in heaven. He went to prepare a habitation now. Amen. He said, if I do not go, the comforter cannot come. In other words, if Christ had not been released back from where it all began, he couldn't have unlocked the rivers of living water to give us the place in which we are the temple of Holy Spirit. Amen. So it's making sense. The prophetic is our habitation. It's not some oil we got to call down. It's not something we can watch on a YouTube video, ball up and throw. It's not something you can rub by and stir up. See, this is the thing. The presence of the Lord is tangible when you pray because you are the habitation of the Spirit. The reason why the atmosphere doesn't change in most people is because they have not cultivated Holy Spirit on the inside of them. Has nothing to do with levels of anointing. Nothing. There is no tiny Holy Spirit on the inside of you. Teach, Apostle. There's no such thing as a little bitty Holy Ghost. Doesn't exist. But there is a carnal man that can block his moving. And his access. The prophetic is our communion. All the time. Break bread in your own heart. Drink the cup that is in you. We're going to break the bread. Do that. Not dismissing communion. Because I believe that it represents what is internalized Amen. and symbolized. It's an act of remembrance. Yes. And one of the most sacred things we can do in the midst of community, and all of my communion stuff was jacked up this morning. I couldn't bring it. I had to throw it in the trash because I wanted to do communion today. The prophetic is our communion with God. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. The Lord is near to the inner man. The, the word heart means your inner being. You must internalize. The word is not my heart feels. It's my inner man loves Jesus. It's the inner man. 
The, that word broken, it means, it literally means pulverized, destroyed. The pulverized inner man, which is what Christ came to rebuild. That's the ancient ruin. The ancient path. Hmm. The prophetic is communion with God all the time. He said this in his own words, I will never leave you or forsake you. Amen. He said, I am the light into your path, the lamp into your feet. David said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not what want. I shall not desire. I shall not long. Mm -hmm. Because he knew we have everything. Amen. We just don't know we have everything. Yes. Now I understand why Peter could say I'm not worthy to be crucified on a cross right side up. Wow. Flip me upside down. I understand now why Stephen could be beaten to death and look up and totally be filled with joy because he understood that he's living a prophetic life. The prophetic is our very present help. You can't separate Holy Spirit or the anointing from the prophetic because it's the same. The prophetic is the very Spirit of God. It is the nature and the power of God operating in and through mankind and in the earth to fulfill his purposes and intent. Christ said, I'm in this world, but I'm not of it. Amen. In other words, I'm around all this, this natural behavior, all these natural experiences, but I'm fully prophetic. fully supernatural listen I'm not going to read Isaiah 61 we should know that one with blindfolds on and no hearing we talk about it all the time it's one of the most beautiful passages in the Bible and, and you know we've, we've taken that passage of scripture and we've made it about us the Lord has anointed me I'm the greatest prophet that ever lived Because we have to reclaim these things and put them in right perspective. There are people who have greater authority and greater authority gives you greater access. That's important. So we're not talking about the prophetic or things of the prophetic outside of authority because authority matters. Yes. Endurance matters. Time put in matters. Yeah. It matters in the right heart. It matters. So I don't want anybody thinking that those things don't. But there is a lifestyle that we are obtaining to. And we're about to turn the tide and I won't be much longer. We have an opportunity to not just be prophetic, but to exist and live in our true identity, which is a prophetic lifestyle. Putting on the mind of Christ is not an idea or a concept is a call into a prophetic lifestyle. Yes. What do I mean? Thinking like he did. Making decisions like he did. Handling my emotions like he did. None of us can do that to the extent that he did, but we can give it our all. Every day we can make a conscious choice. I'm going to choose to be as close to the pattern of the one I love as I possibly can. That's what he's asking. Peter, do you love me? He's not asking you to be perfect. He's asking you to try. Hmm. We have to move away from simply moving in the prophetic, but move with the prophetic lifestyle. Not see, simply seeking prophetic gifts, but seeking a prophetic lifestyle. Not simply seeking prophetic movement, 
But to become the prophetic movement itself, you should become the revival. Paul became the revival for everyone he encountered. Mm, Peter became revival for everyone he encountered in his metron. I'm not telling you to set up a tent and go in. (laughs) I'm just saying that we have to live in a place where we look for the opportunities presented to us in our metron or our measure. And artists are the perfect people to do that. Because we can do it with a painting and bring people right in. Yes. We saw it at the Scribal Advance. Yes. Mm-hmm. People couldn't take their eyes off of some of those paintings. Yeah. We've seen it happen with the Word. Certain things that were taught had people captivated. Do you follow? What is it that you have perfected or are perfecting in your prophetic lifestyle that draws men unto God? Because if we understand it's a prophetic lifestyle, we'll stop looking for conferences and buildings. We'll stop chasing men thinking they got something that's going to fall on us. Simply because they have a gift that we have worshipped. You should be looking for the image, not the gift. See, if you're choosing a mentor, you're choosing a pastor, look for their representation of image. Look for image. Not gifting. Because Balaam prophesied. A donkey declared a thing. (laughs) I'm just being real. Even Simon the sorcerer could do some stuff. So if you go on the gift alone, you will miss it. Amen. I know because I've chased idols. We all have. Listen. The prophetic lifestyle is based on immersion. It is. It really is. Matthew 28. This is my scripture forever. Cannot get away from this scripture. And I have such revelation about it now. Oh my God. Since the conference. Is taking me in a whole new place. And when I've taught this, I haven't taught it so much in the Scribal Conservatory, but when I've taught it in the past, I always give the image of someone dropping one of those gigantic heavy beach towels in a pool. And when you have the beach towel, you can do anything you want with it. But when you throw it in the water, it takes the shape of the pool of the water. Why? Because it's immersed. It's immersed. It's dripping. It's overflowing. It can be saturated to the point where you can't put any more water in it. An immersion is like this. I'm going to read this because it's important. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. We're coming back to 2 Corinthians 6, so don't lose your spot there. Because we do have everything. I want you to hear this. It says, Yeshua came and talked with them. He said, I'm reading from the Jewish Bible. I switched on you again. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make people from all nations into students. Talmudim. Immersing them into the reality. This blessed me. The reality of the Father, the reality of the Son, and the reality of Ruach HaKodesh. And teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I will be with you always. Yes, even until the end of the age. The reality of. This is the part that I want to stop on. The reality. There's a, there, I know that there is a Greek meaning for this. But there's a Hebrew concept that we cannot abandon. The, the, the Hebrew reality of this is the word emet. E-M-E-T. I'm pronouncing it wrong. I always do. It means this. In Jewish thought, it means the word of truth concerning God. The word of truth concerning God. 
There is an understanding in, in Jewish thought of the appearance of truth, which is a false reality. And there is an understanding of the word of truth or the totality of truth, of which God is constantly always unfolding and cannot squeeze, and it can't be squeezed into a demonstration or even a singular pattern of thinking. It is, a belief, it is a belief that there is nothing in all creation that exists without the totality of God. Of the totality of the knowledge of, of the understanding of God. In other words, anything you can pick out, whether in the cosmos, whether in the earth realm, there is nothing you can discuss as believers outside of an understanding of who God is. Which presents us with this question. There is an endless and vast amount of knowledge and understanding. Way beyond what we were taught in Sunday school in the 1970s. <laughs> That's when I grew up in Sunday school. By vacation Bible school. I was taught you can only do it. It's only understood this way. You follow what I mean? So there's this place of, so this immersing, this place of reality is a place of immersion that continuously brings you into the prophetic life. You can't say, I only read from this Bible because that's the only Bible in the world that God told me I can use. That is ridiculous. <laughs> ridiculous. Or that is the only type of music that gets me in the presence of the Lord. Hello, Teresa. No, it's not. <laughs> but it's, it's, what you have, uh, uh, it's what you have cultured yourself to. I used, uh, that ain't even a word, but I just made it up. <laughs> we have fallen prey to doctrines that limit God to our human comprehension. As it relates to not only how he moves, but how he moves in us, how he moves through us, how he moves in the earth, how he moves in the lives of others. We've done nothing but place limitations on our own prophetic reality. Mm. Wow. Wow. And a lot of them I call spiritual scams. Because they're put in place to control mm -hmm. and to manipulate. Whether we realize it or not, we try to control our own selves with some of these things. Mm -hmm. And listen, this is the part that blessed me the most. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 1, he said, he said this, As God's fellow co-workers, we also urge you to receive his grace and then and he, to receive his grace he also urges you not to receive his grace and then do nothing with it. Listen to this. <laughs> if we continue to believe or live as if moves of the prophetic are, are separated from us, if we continue to believe that we've got to stir up work, beat the bushes to get a miracle sign and wonder, guess what we have done? We have done nothing with the grace we received. Good. We've denied the justice of Christ in our own lives. Yeah. Wow. Hallelujah. Right. Mm. Christ didn't die for you to have to fast 50 years Thank you. to get a breakthrough. Christ did not die and be resurrected for you to not have his mind. Mm -hmm. Access to his mind is really access to the mind of God. Amen. What does that mean? If I'm fully prophetic, I can actually begin to live a lifestyle in, in which every move I make is not based on a prayer decision. 
Because I then become what? A house of prayer. Lord, make me a house. And see, listen, but he just said you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are. We are the dwelling place. We're the tent. So if I'm the tent, What's wrong? I have no cultivation. I'm failing to internalize what has been given to me. If it's not internalized, what is it? It's just a story I read in a book. And that's the truth. It applies to everybody else but me. I've got to figure out how to get it. How hard can I work to get it? That's what it becomes. One thing Dr. K said, I, I can't remember when this, when this was, but it was when um, Christ was being baptized and the Lord said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. He had done nothing at that point, but show up. Wow. You know, I love when the word is open to us. Amen. And it's just, you know, we literally have to decide how much we're willing to take in. Hallelujah. <laughs> wow. I don't want to live in a place of denied justice. Amen. And, you know, we want justice. We want justice. We want justice. And I'm not just saying justice in the sense of us being done wrong. We do ourselves wrong. Amen. This is the first book I ever wrote. Ever. This was written in 2002. This is my only copy. It's yellowing at, on the, at the edge of the pages. But this is the first journal immediately after my salvation. Immediately. And the pages in here are yellowing. And I've been going through reading my past journals for one year. This is not one year. This is just a month and a half. But um, for one year, I prayed for nothing but my sister-in-law and her children. I didn't realize I prayed for them that much. I have so much in here about um, my daughter, my middle daughter, Ashanti, my sister, Faye, her kids, Alex, Jamel, and Jessica. I mean, I have every, I prayed for them so much, it was crazy. And I had only been saved a month. I started reading my journals, and by the time I got to the month and a half, I was like, how in the world did I gain these concepts about God in a month and a half of salvation? How? I'm telling you, I scared myself. I have poetry and poetry, all three of poetry I've never written other, other than in this journal. And I started going through my other ones. I have like so many books I could write. But this is the significance of me sharing this. I prophesied to myself. Amen. And didn't even know it was prophecy. I would say things like, Lord, I want to be a great writer. Lord, I want to do poetry for you. Lord, I want to teach your word. And I had something in here. Lord, they keep talking about apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Am I one of these? A month and a half of salvation. Man. A month and a half. Amen. I didn't realize how cleared up my mind was coming, becoming. Right. And I had only been saved a month and a half. My point, we often don't see what God has done until we're at the finish line of a thing. Mm. We despise small beginnings. I can see so clearly in these journals that even after a month and a half salvation, I was whoosh, already leaping over walls in the spirit. And the more in six months, I remember we had our first arts event. And I remember um, that same month after I got saved, 
a man was hit by a car and I witnessed it. I jumped out of the car. I ran over and I laid hands and I began to pray in the spirit over him. I have that in here. On God be road and on old, off of old national highway. Wow. Saved about 40 days. <laughs> I'm telling you, I would give anything to have I have it back now, but I would have given anything to have remained in that prophetic because I was living the prophetic life. Amen. Mm -hmm. My first encounter with God was an immersion in a level of the prophetic life. Amen. Can you see what I mean? Yes. I'm going to share this with you. I got to share this. Um... I was talking about, I can't find it, but I'll just, I'll just share it. I was praying for my mother. I have prayers about my mother all through here. But I was praying um, here and I said, one of the things that I, I asked the Lord in the midst of this, I said, Lord, I am so excited about you that I can't control it. Mm. <laughs> Don't ever let this joy stop. I've been passionate about the Lord ever since and relentless. Mm -hmm. And the Lord said, you prophesied that in many of your journals, don't ever let me be dry for you. Don't ever let me. I prophesied that over myself. Yeah. Are you guys hearing? Yes. Whenever I get depressed or down or I feel it coming on, I was like, stir up that fire and that passion. Man. Because we are responsible for it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we need the prophetic lifestyle. And this is, brings me to the conclusion of the message. And I think this is going to bless you. Huh. The prophetic is God's grace. Man. It is his mercy. It is his love. It's not a tool for your ministry. It's not a tool to grow your church. It is his grace. It is his mercy. His grace and his mercy endures forever. The prophetic is his love. The prophetic is his covenant. Amen. I need you to see this. Because when the prophetic is in operations, ruined cities, ancient cities are rebuilt. The prophetic is the spirit of God moving to reconcile. It is the spirit of reconciliation. But we scared to prophesy. But we want the manifestation of the gifts. We scared. Well, I don't want to sing. I don't want to do my poem. I don't want to dance. But he moved you. The moving of the prophetic is an act of reconciliation. It is the intimacy of God. Amen. It's his cry to be intimate with you. Yeah. Teresa, preach my word. I don't want to do that. <laughs> but yet, you want him. Wow. Talk about double-minded. Mm -hmm. Denied justice. Mm -hmm. We're pointing 
at everybody else and we're denying someone their freedom. You not walking in your calling is denied justice. It's denied justice for your family. It's denied the justice for your grandchildren. It's denied justice for what you are hoping for in your own life. I should be dead. I should be dead. My mind should be have me locked up in a mental institution for the rest of my life. Immersion saved me. The prophetic lifestyle saved me. Yes. One just scripture alone. Right. It was the internalizing of the scripture. Yes. Everything Christ did was the fulfillment of prophecy because Christ himself was the prophetic word made flesh. We were prophesied before the foundations of the world. We are the word made flesh. We're not Christ, but we're the word made flesh. That should deal with rejection right there. Listen, Jeremiah said this, proves what I'm saying. Jeremiah 31, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them declares the Lord. I know the context of this, but hear it by the Spirit. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their inner man. And I will write it. And I will be their God and they will be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. He's already done that. See, the, see, Paul understood, this is the conclusion, Paul understood that living a prophetic lifestyle is what caused him to have joy. Because he understood that what he had was an inheritance far greater than anything this earth life could give. He understood, like I understand, that if I didn't have to, I wouldn't be here. Not my choice to be here, but it's God's choice. I'm not going to go jump off a bridge. But I'm saying to you, I remember when I almost died and I was in between worlds. And I can remember when, and I know that's weird if you've never experienced that, just ask God. But I can remember when the Lord says, do you want to go or do you want to stay? just saying we have more choice than we think mm-hmm. yeah. yep <laughs> Paul was saying to us in, in, in 2 Corinthians 6 I know I'm long but he was saying in 2 Corinthians 6 verse 10 he said no 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 yeah I'm going to read it and he said I'm going to start at 1 as people as God's fellow co-workers we also urge you to um, not to receive his grace and do nothing with it in other words don't just receive God and then just live your life unempowered right. wow. for he says at the acceptable time I heard you in the day of salvation I helped you the Lord said I came to help you And he's not throwing a grit guilt trip, but he's saying, if you really love me, you will love me enough to do what I have called you to do. 
We try not to put obstacles in anyone's path so that no one can find fault with the work that we do. On the contrary, we commend ourselves in every way as workers of God, continually enduring troubles, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, overwork, lack of sleep, lack of food. We commend ourselves by our purity. We commend ourselves through our use of righteous weapons. And we commend ourselves as God's workers headed for death, yet look, we're alive as punished, yet not killed. As having reason to be sad, yet always filled with joy. As poor, yet making many people rich. As having nothing, yet having everything. The prophetic lifestyle brings you into the reality of being wealthy. Because that first place of wealth begins in your soul. My greatest treasure is that I'm not tormented. In my mind. That's the greatest gift God gave me. To have peace. Amen. Wow. The benefits of prophetic lifestyle, that's one of the biggest benefits. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's what he came to do, to rebuild the inner man. Mm -hmm. The benefits of the prophetic lifestyle is to be whole again. Amen. And there's a joy in pursuing it. Accessing the prophetic lifestyle, apprehend that you already have it. That's number one. I have everything. Number two, recognize that the prophetic life is born, your your most broken place is born through brokenness. It is. It's born through brokenness. He came to fix and to cry out and to save a lost people. Lost should be understood as not connected, broken, separated, pulled apart. He came to restore you. Amen. Restore your mind. Restore the pain, the rejection, the hurt, the lack of love. Too much time in a mental hospital for me. People don't believe that when I tell them. My husband can tell you I was a mess and I'm not exaggerating. Hearing voices. Taking pills, pacing. I would literally do this at night while everybody was asleep. Trying to stop the voices in my head. Walking, things telling me to do things to my kids. Do things to the people around me. And I'm just pacing four little squares on the floor, counting them until it stopped. Or video games. I would play those until I lost my mind. Then I'd go to work, function all day, come home and go right back to angry, bitter, mad. Tell me the prophetic life can release you from that. I'm telling you. Recognize that you are spirit born of the spirit. Read 2 Corinthians 5 on your own. People use this passage of scripture for funerals all the time and it's sad. But though we have this earthly house. (laughs) Okay. But the scripture is amazing because it literally tells us we are spirit. (laughs) Y'all move on. (laughs) We need to recognize that you must cultivate your spirit, your spirit man, cultivate your soul. Recognize that there is no spiritual you and a natural you. There's just one you. Be yourself. And let God work it out. With you. Ask Holy Spirit to help you love the word and to internalize the word of God. You know, I'm going to tell you, if we would spend more time in where some people can't afford to be out of church or out of the congregation. I'm not saying that everybody has to be committed to doing this, but if your spirit man is not nurtured, you're not strong enough to be independent of a fellowship. 
And so that's why fellowship is so important because it keeps you grounded. It keeps you turning to You're constantly turning back to him. You're constantly until you just can do it in your heart without help. There is more for you than just salvation. Second Peter one and three and I'm done. Grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus, our Lord. His divine power has given us everything Hallelujah. we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and excellence. Through these, he has given us his precious and magnificent promises so that through them you may become partakers of divine nature. Now that you have escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil doers. It's here in the word. His divine power has given us everything. How dare us separate the prophetic from the nature of God. How dare us try to pull a gift without cultivating the prophetic nature, divine nature of God on the inside of us. If we're image, we are already living a prophetic lifestyle. Amen.